With God, there is always more. More love, more life, more freedom. Welcome to Zoe's Exploring More with Michael Thompson. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Our Heavenly Father has provided many delightful ends for us along our journey, but He takes great care to see that we do not mistake any of them for home. Join me and the team as we explore the kingdom together, discovering the deep truths and offering encouragement for the journey. There is always more. Welcome, friends and allies, to the Exploring More podcast. I'm Michael Thompson, and I am here with my friends who I love exploring the kingdom more. together. Yeah, exploring more. So SJ, who uh, you know, you know Greg Sailor's on our team, and we've got the captain, Jeff Andreessen, with us again this week as a special guest. Yeah, I think it's appropriate, a special, special guest, Kevin Kasner. Uh, I've known Kevin for, gosh, it's, well, it's over a decade. It's probably about 12, 13 years. Mm-hmm. Our lives collided through Ransom Heart and Wild at Heart back in the uh, early 2000s. That's right. Kevin was running with another brother in crime, Haynes Maxwell, and they were doing this thing in the barn, it's literally in a barn outside of South Charlotte. And guys were coming on Tuesday nights, been doing that for how long? It'll be 15 years. <laughs> 15 yeah. years. Wow. It's uh, the yeah. coolest man cave yeah. ever. <laughs> Yeah, it's got everything. Men who shave, boys who shave, men, <laughs> men who run around and you got all the toys. It's got all the toys. I like it's what so. Says. He says Bambi and all his kin. Yeah. yeah, there's a few. There's a few mounts in there. But Kevin, so good to have you with us. Have you here on the road with us? Like I said, we're over at Jeff Andreessen's doing on the road podcasting, and we're talking about orientation. Kevin is a man who has journeyed with God through a lot of things, health and family and marriage and fatherhood and a lot of brotherhood helped a lot of men find their way out of the ditch. A lot of men find their way. Men crawl to that barn sometimes. Yes. And, uh, and then there's other guys that Kevin and Haynes have carried yeah. to that barn. Strapped and, to the roof and, and dragged. And they, uh, they help them. And that's a good thing. So yeah, Kevin, why don't we start with just this idea of for you, because I really want our listeners to have the privilege of hearing some of your story I know it's not all candles and cake and presents. Right. It's got its valleys yeah. of the shadow of death. And, and so, but about orientation. So as we explore together about what it means to be an oriented man, a man who knows who he is, where he is, and the good that God is up to in his life, that's what we have discovered is orientation. And it's a learned thing. Sure. And then it's practiced. Learned and, and, and earned. And then like you said last week, Greg and Jeff both, it's forgotten from time to time. It's lost mm-hmm. from time to time. And I'm not sure that all of us in our own unique way get off the path. I would say in my life, I wonder if God has moved the path a few times. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, and then you're like, wait a so second. That, so, that what, so that I am not ever in danger uh-huh. of getting into a system or relying on my maps and my comfortability and what I'm used to, but rather technology increases, right? God seems to want me to increase to new heights of walking with him, intimacy with him, which yes. is our first pillar, intimacy, mm-hmm. oneness, and connectedness. So Kevin, if you could share a little bit about your story and how orientation has come in, maybe where you were before those early 2000s, uh, right. a man on a journey like every man is, women as well. Just let us into your story a little bit. I will. Thanks. It's an honor to be here with you guys. This is fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I think that a big part of the orientation part is the saying hindsight's 2020 and, you know, where we are today. And then we see things differently when we look back on where we were 10, 15 years ago. And 10, 15 years ago, I really didn't know where I was. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know that orientation. When I think about guys coming to Heart of the Warrior for the very first time or the guys that are entering into or engaging with men for the very first time, whether it be at the barn or at the forge or one, you know, somewhere, we don't know where that man's coming from and the filters that he's seeing life through. And looking back on my life prior to going out to Colorado in May of 04 for the first time after reading Wild at Heart Heart, and seeing what I saw and experiencing what I experienced there it was through the filters of where I was right the then. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I knew I needed something, right. right? That describes a lot of men like you were talking about last week, SJ, but yeah. So the filter of 
what my relationship with God had been as far as for lack thereof after being in the mainstream church for a lot of years and having the opportunity to see it from a different perspective. The only thing that I know looking back is I got a hold of something and looking back, it was really based a lot on what I could see and what I could feel. And I kind of equate that to, okay, I had knowledge of Jesus, yeah, but I really didn't know the love of the Father, and I really didn't understand the power of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we use triangulation points, and for those, the three, if you've got one, it's okay. It's better than not having any, but it doesn't work, you know, for a long period of time. In the beginning, that's really where I was. And then... As we started the barn, yeah, a big thing about that is I found something that really worked for me. Mm-hmm. Looking for friends, looking to foster those friendships, right. looking Create, to see. Yeah. I saw something and I wanted that. And it was almost like a flattery by copying somebody else. You, you sit there, man, I want that. that I yeah. want that for my son, whether it be Bart's story or you know, right. you hear a different story. So my orientation, I would say I was more oriented than I had been after experiencing that, Mm -hmm. but I was still operating off of one mechanism. Yeah. And that mechanism is great. As I mentioned earlier, you fly VFR or IFR, right? And if you can see your surroundings, I've got those surroundings memorized, Mm -hmm. frontwards, backwards, sideways. Yeah, familiarity. And And that's like, you know, when you're a little kid at the pool, you can't swim yet, but as long as you're close to that ladder and grab onto that ladder, you feel okay. But when you get away from that ladder or those clouds come in or the darkness come in, all of a sudden, you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Yeah, yeah. And your story like mine, Kevin, and all these men at the table have done this. When you experience God in an incredible way and whoever somehow modeled that or taught that or set you under a tree or on on a porch, you know, you want to, okay, I want to do it like those guys. I mean, there's there's a beautiful part of that. And so the barn started and... Zoe started and so many other new formations before. I mean, so many friends and allies. I mean, the family tree within Ransom Hart, John Eldridge, Gary Barkalo, Craig McConnell, Bart Hansen, Morgan Snyder. I mean, these guys have loved men back to life. Absolutely. For come almost two decades. That's correct. And so we did what we couldn't help but do is create an environment correct. for that for ourselves. Honest selfishness, honest. Mm-hmm. I want that. So I want to dig a foxhole or create a safe house or a barn or an outpost where men can come and maybe that could happen for me. Yes. So I think those are beautiful beginnings, not to diminish anybody who wants to start that way. But then, you know, God's going to unravel some more. Right. He's going to disconnect some things. The false self is not gone. No. But what a different environment to be dismantled. Sure. And I think of my decade through the 2000s, you know, how God showed me some things about me that he wanted to give some attention to. And whether it was like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, whether it was the forge and the fire and hammering it out, or it was just getting on the gurney and letting him do some really delicate yep. work yep. and really sensitive, soft words and experiencing and encountering him. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about that. I'm glad you want to talk about it now. You know, those kinds of exchanges with the father, it's not all hammers. It's not all, no. it's not all fire. There's some very, very tender moments when God has come for me in the midst of this mission. Maybe if we could create an environment for men to connect with one another, that's exactly what the environment's for, to explore, to learn the ways of the kingdom and to learn who we're not. Right. And to have other eyes on your life, as well as this is the company you keep and have other men that will give me the kind of honest, loving feedback. Hey, I may not be right. Can we talk about something, you know, even within our team? This happens all the time. Because we didn't know what we were doing when we started. And, and, and Lord, thank you, Lord, yes. because if we did, we'd have just stayed with the plan. That's exactly right. You know, at some point your charts run out, Yeah, your plan runs out, your map runs out, and now you finally are on, I don't know how to do this. And that's when a new level of orientation becomes. Like God has said, to show up. Yeah. Intimacy, oneness, and connectedness with God is always true north. Yes. It's mm-hmm. always what our foundation is to be, no matter how far out in front of our skis we get, no matter how confused. And confused is a little different than disoriented, but I haven't been here before. 
that's an honest thing. Yeah. I you don't were, know what to do. That's yeah. an honest thing. Earlier in the podcast, Michael, you were talking about that sometimes God just moves the trail. And what occurred to me as you said that was there are times, and I think it's a large portion of the time, that we're just at the edge of the map mm -hmm. with God. There's no trail. Jeff, you're a huge Lewis and Clark fan. He's blazing a trail with us. We're in undiscovered territory, really. Now, he will, in his kindness, let you come back from the edge of the map from time to time, right? And gather yourself and get some rest and get some reorientation. And then you're back out at the edge. If you haven't been off the edge of the map, listeners, in a while, you may be in a place where you might want to ask why. You know what I call that? Domestication. Domestication. That's exactly right. <laughs> so and Kevin, cushions yeah, and doilies. Yeah. That's, and the, that's the you're on a cruise ship. Not on a battleship, right? right? I mean, you, And that's not what we're made no. for. And as we learn this life of God, as we learn to be who we are as image yeah. bearers, you're going to hit frontier. You're going to get out in front of your skis. You're going to be, I'm not sure what this is. I've never been and, here before. Go ahead, Jeff. So, Kev, I was just like you. If there's three great mysteries, who is God really? And then mystery two, who are you really? And then mystery number three, why are you here? Yes. I had an idea of the first mystery, who was God. But it's eternal. I'm going to learn more about him. But I had no idea. I had one rung on the ladder. Uh, yes. You know? mm -hmm. And it sounds like you were the same. So what did it look like to move into that, maybe that next mystery of who am I, really? Well, there was two sides of it. Because as I started walking in this message and learning and really being able to interpret the life of Jesus and the love of the Father that was there for me, and it wasn't necessarily through study. It was through the relationships that were formed over the course of time with the other men that were coming to the barn. Mm -hmm. And hearing... Life on life. Yeah, hearing, man the, on man. hearing the stories, seeing everybody throwing their stuff out and being very glad to be able to grab mine back. You know, I think that that started me in a more intimate, if you will, relationship with God. Although I still had those filters in place from before, mm -hmm. you know, because those things, unless they're really dealt with, they don't go away. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but it's like the things that I came in with, I didn't just automatically get rid of. There's still some interpretations and actually some woundings that were deep within me that I did not realize. Right. I hit in the first layer, maybe the second layer, maybe even a third or fourth layer of things that I needed to deal with that through other people's story. And you say, yeah, that's a place I need to I go, go to. to. Yeah. Right. But the unknown, the unsaid things that you don't even realize are there. And I didn't until yeah. many years later. And you couldn't have if you'd wanted to. Right. You know, back to this, who's in charge of this comeback anyway? Yes. You know, we partner with God we give him our will and we let him have his way. Yes. And so what we would say as a band of brothers, as a team in this, that there were initial months of significant healing when we saw the woundedness of 20 years or 30 years. Right. And then the inbox becomes less, mm -hmm. but there's still some things that you want to get to while at the same time, okay, I'm trying to be a parent of an eight-year-old. Right. Or trying to work out the finances again this quarter. Right. You're still in the battle. Being the father, being the husband, yep. being the facilitator of this group going on here. And you won't get clarity as to what's going on here if you weren't there. Right. But that orientation is so helpful. I know God's after some things. I'm aware now that I have a false self construct. I have a system that needs to die. Yes. That actually I'm going to be invited to put my hands on it. So that means I have to see it. So therefore, God's and his love is going to show me. And the journey continues. The, the journey, yeah. the dismantling, as well as the construction and the reconstruction of who I really am. Let's get this stuff off of me. I just remember, you know, you were talking about superheroes, Greg, so many superheroes, the Marvel and the DC, the stories are of losing one identity and coming to another one. And so many stories that we love are the stories of an identity lost and an identity found. And these make for such epic stories, whether they are from the Lord of the Rings, Cinderella Man, watching these different films, 
And yet we see Jesus doing the very same thing with the men that were his closest friends and followers. To find your life, the paradox, you're going to have to lose lose it. it. Right. And you're not going to find your life unless you lose your first one. And how necessary that is, but how disruptive it is. Oh, yeah. And as we talk about citizenship, it's even moving from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh that we see in Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. And learning how to live newly. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And And it's in the crucible of difficulty, as we discussed in the last one, that often that heart is softened or the wall that's around the heart is brought down so that the heart can be softened. And unfortunately, except for adversity, you know, it doesn't happen most Mm -hmm. of the time. Sometimes by God's grace, it does, but the adversity is usually mm-hmm. where it's found. One of right. the my favorite stories with that is Doctor Strange. If you have seen that movie, you know that he's the best surgeon there is. He's very cocky, and he's on a windy road in the middle of a thunderstorm, and he has a wreck, and he loses the thing that's most precious to him, which is his hands. Mm-hmm. A surgeon. A surgeon. Yeah, where his identity that, is. Yeah. And just prior to that, he's doing a surgery on a brain where he has to go, like you said, no longer going to use navigation on the ground. He's got to go celestial. So he had to go celestial and go in and get this bullet freehand. Well, he has the wreck, right? And then he goes through all these surgeries, trying his best to get back what he had lost, not knowing that what was in front of him was better mm. than right. anything he had ever had. Yeah, he lost what he thought was his identity. But his real identity came to him through adversity. That's right. And he had to go find somebody to help him. That's an epic story. And speaking of epic stories, tell us a little bit about the adversity, Kevin, that you've been facing for the last few years. If you can think of a few stories, and if you're willing to share, how has God shown up and shown you your true identity through this adversity? I was diagnosed three years ago this past February with stage 4B head and neck cancer. And at that time, they were going to use curative therapy on me. It was something that they felt like they could take care of. Leading up to that, for a number of years, I was, I say all the time, I'm a recovering people pleaser. I've been in sales all of my life, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'll never forget one of my first trainers you know, all the personality profiles you take over the years. And they said, gee, Kevin, you're a chameleon. You can talk to anybody. And I thought, though, that's kind of cool. A compliment, yeah. That's Mm -hmm. great. That's great. Until you get so wrapped up in being what you need to be for everybody else that you forget who you are or if there was ever something there to go back to pay dirt with. Oh, wow. And I brought that into the ministry, really, without thinking about it, knowing about it, and still looking to make sure everything was good, be a good steward of the barn that my brother-in-law is letting me use and everything that comes along with that, picking up the coffee cups and the paper towels and, you know, just taking care of everything because there was a responsibility. I really did bring a lot of those people-pleasing antics, if you will, into what I did. And God still blessed it in spite of my silliness and not having full understanding And within those times, there was times where the only thing that was really working in my life that seemed to be working was the ministry at the barn. Didn't feel like I was fathering well. I didn't feel like I was being the husband I needed to be. And this is coming from years of being in there and promoting, you know. Being a good dad and being a good husband. You know, raising the sons, the restoration of marriages. Right. And then I find myself in a place where— I was exhausted, Mm. literally, physically, mentally, emotionally exhausted. And within that, man, I made some mistakes. I went to some dark places. My comfort place was I was okay alone, you know? Mm. And there were, over a course of the years leading up to my diagnosis, unfortunately, that was a part of my life. You know, we could sit here and have a red chair meeting and throw that stuff out. And the shame that Mm -hmm. comes along that you carry within that. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, I let down one mask and took up another one. And you perpetually find yourself going from one mask to another. Yeah, that's exhausting. Yeah. So 
you know, one of the things about cancer is they say everybody has cancer cells in their body. It's when your immune system gets deficient and they go crazy from a medical standpoint. And three years ago, that happened with me. And three years ago, I separated from my wife. After being part of the barn and doing what I'd done, you want to talk about feeling like a hypocrite. Mm. And once again, the enemy comes in on that ground too with the shame sure. and the guilt and everything that came along. Mm -hmm. And even within my closest circles, I felt that there was something that I needed to do if I was ever going to get healed from this thing. And some of those decisions, I think, were good. And as of today, I can look back and know that they are good because I have hope. I have a future. I've learned a lot of things. Mm -hmm. There were mistakes that I made. And all of that to say, when I hear and I see the guys at Heart of the Warrior, they come to the barn and, you know, we use the term charging the fields at Bannockburn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, the enemy is subtle and he can use ministry to be subtle. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And those things that can easily entangle you and get caught up in, they seem to be unexplainable at some point in time. Mm -hmm. So, Scott, to get back to your question, the last three years after going through the diagnosis, I've always been more of a holistic type person. I wasn't going to do this. I wasn't going to do that. And when you get diagnosed, everybody and their brother has a silver bullet. <laughs> right. You know, good-hearted people, oh, they yeah. mean well. Yeah. Sort of like Job's friends come out of the woodwork. And I made the decision after doing some research that I was going to go forward with the initial treatment that they offered me which was 25 days straight of radiation along with a type of chemotherapy. It's one of the toughest protocols. And yeah. it, when I started all this, I was 230 pounds. Sitting here today, I'm 162. I went through that, had to have a feeding tube. And just, I'll tell you, at that particular point in time, being separated, going through treatment, it was really a time of survival for me. More than anything else, it was one of those times where I couldn't think about anybody else. And there's a lot of that that hurt, you mm -hmm. know, thinking about the people that I love and friendships and some I had to let go of. And then the half truths that I'm having to tell to keep the ones that are in my closest inner circle close mm -hmm. because I didn't want to lose them. I didn't want to take the risk of losing them. So you thought you were going to lose them if you told them everything that was going on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I was still had that mask on, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and in some ways I've used this metaphor before, but when I was going through this treatment, they made a mask for me mm. and there were grommets around the side. And when I was going through this treatment, they fastened those grommets to the table to where I am immobilized. Wow. Oh, hold, holding and your head perfectly Holding still. my head perfectly still. Mm. I have mouthpiece in my mouth. Mm -hmm. I'm going through chemo. Luckily, I didn't ever have problem with nausea too much, but you still feel like you're going to regurgitate at any given time. And my biggest fear was regurgitating in that mask, you know, while I'm on the sure. table, mm -hmm. you know. It's like throwing up in your football helmet. When yeah, you're absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, those, those first practices, yeah. oh, man. two a days but, and hot and all but, that crazy. Oh, my gosh. That's... But, you know, I, I look at Oof. it and, you know, think, okay. I had to be held down and immobilized so that he could be turned up to get rid of something that wasn't supposed to be there. Wow. Yeah. So I go through that and get a clear scan, and I'm still dealing with some relational stuff. At that time, things weren't good with my son, who was a teenager at the time, and unbelievably awesome young mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. And God is restoring that and has restored a lot of it that I'm so thankful for. Wow. And the thing is, is I realize that, you know, he took a lot of arrows that weren't meant for him. And a lot of them came from me, you mm -hmm. know? Sure. Wow. Yeah. So last thing we want to do is dads. It's, <laughs> it's the thing that happened to us. Most dads don't intend for that to happen, but the enemy's that good. And it's just hard to be, Yeah. you know, a hundred percent every day, all day and be oriented all the time and know that they live in the same story. So I'm sympathetic to your tears. And yeah. I, I, and I, Empathetic. And, yeah, yeah. We've done it too. And yeah. feel, and feel the, oh yeah, I know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, well, but, you know, it's interesting. I have one awesome kid and I said, okay, I got one shot at this, you know, mm -hmm. but anyway, after a subsequent scan, head and neck's all clear, but there's a spot on my liver and my lung. And so after doing tests, 
the prognosis was. So they were doing full body scans even, yeah. even then after yeah. that. How long after the 21 days? My last radiation, July 22nd, and I think it was August or September, oh. a follow-up scan showed my head and neck clear, but showed subsequent. This thing's moving. Yeah. Well, basically, it's not encapsulated. It's the mm -hmm. prognosis and the diagnosis is that it's in my bloodstream, metastasized. Mm. And so start treating that. And, you know, I won't take you through each phase, but I guess from that point to this, I went through, you know, more radiation immune therapy, mm -hmm. and then a targeted therapy back to where I am right now to, from the medical profession says, it's kind of the last bullet in their gun is another form of chemotherapy. I've outlived two prognoses already. I'm planning on outliving every other one that they give me, you uh -huh. know, because right. I don't believe that God's changed what he put on my heart. And I don't think he's done with me yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and whenever that time comes, I'm all good mm -hmm. because going through what I've gone through over the last three years, you start to focus on the eternal a lot more than those where you could VFR it, touch and yeah. feel and see and you know all of the terrain. You start looking at things in a totally different manner. And that's where that power and that relationship of the Holy Spirit and the Father yeah. do come on. And in the midst of all of this, okay, the barn, this thing I've been a part of for, you know, almost 15 years right. that I initiated and, you know, Haynes came in early and had some wonderful relationships with, knowing that going through what I'm going through, I don't, I don't need to be in leadership here. I need to detach from this. And it took a while. Because you let go and then you grab it again, you let go and you grab it again, mm -hmm. and rightly or wrongly so, from some of my good decisions and from some of my bad right. decisions, making a lot of people scratch their heads, mm -hmm. you know, and over that, having to let go of some friendships. Yeah, and, for now. And for, yeah, maybe, for now. Maybe. For now. Right. And you know what? Today I have more peace about that than any other time, yeah. Yeah. mainly because I read from a book that Jack Deere wrote, even in our brokenness. He talks about, you know, some relationships. It was something that gave me permission to let go of some stuff. Yeah. And it was really life-giving to me. I would say that going through that bittersweet, I want to be there. I miss the fellowship of it. Yeah. God, you take this thing. It was yours to begin with. And what do you got for me today? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the next season? And so today I sit here in anticipation and excitement about this next season. And mm -hmm. I feel like he's given me a few things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's been extremely tough. And I'm happy to dig in, you know, any questions a little yeah. more to where yeah. somebody wants. Well, I have to, one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, early on you were talking, Kevin, about a mask and about masks. Yes. You know, and I know the cure for this cancer, here's this physical realm reality, but there's this spiritual realm thing that you talked about for several minutes, you know, the prognosis of it. Yes. And now here's peace. And I'm excited about what God's going to do. Where do you feel like you are with the treatment of this mask that God has been making available for you to see? X-rays are in, yeah. you know, and listeners, I mean this, this spiritual mask, the last ones maybe that you have hid behind. Yeah. Do you feel like you are out from behind them or they are off of you or you, I do. you feel the pull? Of, I do. Of I, come, that's that's I, a beautiful to, thing. Today, especially, and this has really come, I would say, more so in the last three to six months. Mm -hmm. It's just still fresh. Mm -hmm. It's still right. recent. And it has been a process. Sure. Because I really don't have anything to hide anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. It's there. And I'm sorry for a lot of it but very thankful for where I am today mm -hmm. and, and the future that I have with a new relationship over the moon and excited about restoration of relationships, being able to meet one-on-one -on -one with some of these guys That's that were in that close circle to walk through forgiveness with each other and just to let all that stuff go because it's exhausting and I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah. What occurs to me, Kevin, is when you put on a mask and so much of your self-worth and value is found in what you do, that your real identity is just obscured. It's just hidden. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to do, Kevin, first of all, thank you so much for sharing all that, buddy. But I, I want to take a quick break, listeners. When we come back, I want to talk about, in the context of orientation, I want to talk about who we are. And so as you're telling your story, like I said, your identity was hidden. We've all hidden our identity behind masks or behind the things that we do. 
to some degree. So I want to take our listeners into that a little bit when we come back from this break. All right, we'll be right back. Ladies, what if you or the women in your life could live from a heart that is settled in love, convicted of its worth, and moved by purpose and true desire? What if you could live unafraid and unashamed, sure that you belong? Welcome to The Deepening Journey, a six-session video resource and journal workbook designed to be experienced together with other women or even on your own. It was recorded at Zoe's Deepening Weekend for Women, birthed out of friendship and conversations between our guide team. Learn to experience belovedness. Our hearts need rest, comfort, clarity. We need a chance to be still and hear from God. We invite you to explore with us how we were made to live in God's kingdom and to flourish. Learn what comes against that flourishing and experience the offer of healing, integration, and restoration. Visit thedeepeningjourney.com to launch your voyage into a new chapter in God's kingdom. Welcome back, everybody, to the Exploring More podcast. We're talking with our special, special friend, Kevin Kasner, <laughs> and our special friend, Jeff Andreessen, SJ, myself, and Greg, and really talking about orientation, but really having the opportunity to look at it from a very, very unique story. And I don't know, Kevin, maybe a more common story than we know. I mean, we've all been dashed on the rocks. We've all hit and run aground. You know, we've all had things happen in our lives. These are just particularly yours. Yes. And I think what I want to say, uh, Jeff, is, you know, orientation doesn't make you immune. And the process of even becoming oriented, as you've said in the early part of this podcast, it doesn't somehow put you in safe places. We live in a love story in the midst of a great battle where we live in wartime, spiritual war, spiritual battle. And so I think orientation does afford a man an opportunity to get hit less. Right. But not be hit. I haven't found that guy yet. You know, if Jesus could be crucified, right, for who he was and what he claimed to be, there's something true about the world. This hostile environment we're in, not everybody's going to like where we're at, who we are, and what we're standing for. And then even more so, it can be more challenging when we're down. Yeah. You know, the critics come, or the concern come, the caring can come with interpretations of our story that we want to be really careful to take on and take in, because they're not always right. Not all that they say is true. So discernment, I think, is a real, real quality of being an oriented man and having, we call it the observation deck, having the ability sooner or later, as soon as you can get there, better. Yeah. But sooner or later coming to a place where you can look back, maybe it's back at that morning or back a few minutes ago, or maybe it's back a couple of years. Mm -hmm. What happened? What's going on? Mm -hmm. What was that about? And that's an oriented man who can ask questions like that and walk with God. Yeah. Walking walk with, with God, God and walking in the counsel of other men too. Yeah, yeah. You were about to say something about counsel actually. And we said, okay, right. let's get back on the mics <laughs> okay. and get part two in here. But you had a thought that was important. It's been extremely important. And I guess just to back up a little bit, you know, reason I shared about going from one mask to another and heading up a ministry, we see these guys, lots of zeal. They get excited about this and they do want to rush those fields at Bannockburn. It is subtle. The ministry of it is subtle. And when you find yourself to where that is the only thing working for you in your life, hopefully, I just pray that there'll be a realization of that a little quicker than it was with me. Mm -hmm. I remember being out in Colorado at an advance and Bart telling me this was right after he had taken a sabbatical. And I didn't know that he had done that. And he mentioned to me, have you ever thought of taking a sabbatical? And I'm thinking, man, you want me to stop the one thing in life that's working, For, you, you know? And, and then after I heard his story, I was like, holy smokes. But to bring it back, it's been about a year and a half now. I've had the honor and the pleasure of having counsel with an older gentleman. And, you know, as we go through some of these teachings, and we talk about the sage and mentorship and that kind of thing. 
I have an awesome father, 94 years old, still out mm-hmm. there getting it. And he's a great father. He's a great dad. He's been a great mentor spiritually too. But, you know, sometimes there's things that other people can say that you don't hear from mm-hmm. your father. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a little more license there. And maybe you give them a little bit more license by being vulnerable and yeah. sharing your story. And this is the guy that I needed. You needed, yeah. 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 And if I'd had the ears to hear it or even thought I would have the ears to hear it when I first came to Christ or when I first got a hold of this message at the age of 44, man, I wish someone had just drilled into me is find that guy. Mm-hmm. Find that guy that has wisdom, has life experience. And anyone that's going in or wanting to start a ministry, you've got to have that guy or a group of guys, if you will. Jeff was mentioning, okay, you go through the separation, you get a diagnosis, other relationships, something you've been a part of for 15 years, waning. This gentleman's name is Tom. I named off those four things. And I said, Tom, I think I'm depressed. And it's a word that I'd never used to describe myself. But there was almost a relief when I said that. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. You know, I don't want to claim to be depressed. I don't want, you know, any of this, but I was, you know, there were some good things that were starting to come out of releasing that, but I had to come to that realization of letting go and that it was okay. Mm. You know, it was okay to be feeling that emotion and, and even be quote unquote depressed there, if that's where I got to be. There's you know? absolutely a relief that comes with a diagnosis. Yeah. When you don't know what it is, but you're afflicted. Yeah. That is a desperate position to be in because yeah. it could be anything. I mean, our friend Scott has talked about that on the podcast before where he just didn't know what was going on. Yes. You've experienced that with your diagnosis, with your cancer fight. And with this thing that you're talking about here that, yeah, you know, I mean, so there is a relief that comes with a diagnosis. But, you know, leading on into the identity side of things, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things that I had to really draw a line in the sand with, and I actually think this happened at Heart of the Warrior last year when I wrote this down, is that my identity is not in the barn. Mm-hmm. My identity is not in my diagnosis, Yeah, you know, and coming to terms that, gee, you know, I really am a beloved son Yeah, and I've got people that love me and I got people that are there that are for me. There might be a lot of them that don't understand me, but that's okay. That's you know, right. they, and you know, because mm-hmm. you walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Right. Right. And so that is where. It allowed me the freedom to let go of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It also allowed me to learn to love again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Starting with myself. Yeah, being loved and being okay. I think this is a great chance to turn, Kevin, into, Jeff, if you'd just kind of share these coordinates. I mean, we learned from Gary a lot of things. He's a king, a good king, and a good sage. And we talk about identity and who we are the glory of our lives. If we have a glory, if we have an identity in the kingdom, I believe much of what God wants to do is make known on earth how we're known in heaven. Mm -hmm. The white stone, right, in Revelation 2. And there's an identity thing that who we are. And yes, if we're too attached to something that we do, he may very well remove you from that place to say, no, you're settling, you know, for what's on your business card or what title you hold. That's not who you are, rather, but who you are is what you bring to that title. And so I think this is a good time to then just move, just shift. We've been talking about orientation, and I think what it reminds me of Jeff is story, knowing your story and how it's a critical one of the elements to triangulate to discovering who you truly are. So if you're an oriented man, you're a man who knows who you are, where you are, and the good that God's up to in your life. And that's true for a woman, too. So part of what we've really been dialing into is what has gotten in the way of an identity, where our worth, where your worth, Kevin, particularly in your story. I was feeling my self-esteem yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. And we long for that. All yeah. of us do. It, sure. It's important. We're made to be loved, esteemed, valued, worth. So you want to just share a little bit about what we were talking about even leading up to this, just this idea of our identity, who we are, Mm -hmm. and the glory of your life. So here's these coordinates that need to triangulate 
Yeah. I remember one day a friend of mine came up and he gave me a, this book, Wild at Heart. And he said, Jeff, you're already doing some of this stuff, but I think you should read this. And the truth of it was at that point in my life, I was not really a Sunday morning guy. I had been through it, seen it, done it, and been there. And so read the book, loved it. And my friend Craig Kohlberg says, let's go. We're going to go to a Wild at Heart conference. And our experience might have been similar in the sense of all I knew is I wanted to jump in with both feet at that point. I only had one of the coordinates if we we're going to triangulate, and that was this idea of who is God. But there was going to be so much more. And we loved this message so much, we took it back to our church and we got all the guys involved in it. One of the things I noticed about them is if they understood who was God, they really didn't have any idea of who they were. And if you don't know who you are, you don't really know why you're here. And so that was when I thought, let's bring the expert in. And that was when we found Gary Barklow and we brought this idea of calling to the men. And what Gary brings to help us triangulate our position is story, desire, and journey. And all of that was new to us because for years we've been sitting forward, looking at the guy's head in front of us, hearing about God and maybe hearing a few stories about the pastor's life without anyone really ever turning the mirror back on us and going, okay, let's talk about you. Now, what's interesting about a good leadership is if I'm actually a leader, I'm here to help you find your place on the journey. It's not about you serving my needs and my desires. So we really opened this idea up of our story matters. And we had to really take a lot of time with what is our story. We couldn't even really tell our story. And then to hear that our desires were we had good desires, that was counterintuitive to us. We never even considered that. As church men. As church men, men. yeah. Yeah, yeah. desire I mean, we didn't have we, a place. We, have good desi- we know what the bad desires are. We've been taught what they are. But not only do we have desires, but we have to help them navigate us. That the very next thing that we are to do is the actual thing that we want to do the most. So desire was brand new to us and that this was going to be a journey. This was a process that we were in. And so there you have it, the three points that will help you navigate your position, story, desire, and journey. I like what Kevin was talking about, VFR and IFR. If you're in a 767 and all the lights go out, you don't know whether you had a double engine failure or an electrical problem. There's a switch called RAT, and it'll light up red. You're a Ram Air Turban. And when all goes dark, you look up and you try to find that switch and turn that baby on. And sometimes it takes a period of darkness. As I listen to Kevin tell his story, I can totally relate because it was at this time of my life, I medicaled out from flying. I lost my identity as an airline pilot, which is all of my identity. And my other part of my identity was I was a good dad. And at that point in my life, my daughter was going through a real dark tunnel at 16 years old, and she ran away, and we had to find her and bring her up to a boarding school. Not only a boarding school, but a therapeutic boarding school. And all the things I thought I was were immediately taken away. And that was absolutely a necessary part of my journey. I had to go into that darkness, into that belly you find out all the good heroes of our stories, and we'll just take Maximus, for example, was the general who had to become a slave, who had to become a gladiator. Even Jesus had to spend three days in the belly of the earth, Mm -hmm. right? And I remember listening to Bono from U2, and he was talking about remaking the band. And he said, in order for us to remake that band, we were going to die if we stayed with our old stuff. We had to walk so far out in the desert that we lost sight of who we were in order to find find out out where we we were going. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus, in his mercy, dismantles certain things in our lives, as he did with you, in order to find out who we really are. We really don't know who we are. There's way more to God in this equation, and there's way more to us in this equation. And just because things are falling apart, you're actually in a good place if that's happening. Mm -hmm. You just need somebody to come along and orient you to what's going on and go, okay, let's find out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I remember when I was being dismantled not that long ago, the most recent time I was being dismantled, a quote came across my path, and I think it was... Louis Giglio, but I'm just going to credit Gary Barklow with it uh, because he says all the great (laughs) stuff that we hear. So if you are in the midst of being dismantled, it's so that God can bring you a new mantle. And if you're not dismantled, you still have that mantle on you, right? So you can't be ready for the new mantle he's bringing. 
that was like the oxygen mask dropping down from the ceiling. That was like a life preserver for me, that quote. And hearing that truth. Mm. Because if you're depressed and you've got this diagnosis, and even if you don't have that diagnosis, you are in this place of what the hell is going on? And to hear someone say, you're being dismantled because God has a different mantle for you. That was like the sea became calm instantaneously for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you meet an elder like that, you fall in love with him right away, but he makes sense of your life. And all of a sudden it is. It's a life raft. All of a sudden you find buoyancy in the Mm -hmm. midst of a storm. No doubt. And listeners, if we're honest, there's not a lot of great elders because there's men who have not recovered from the valleys yeah, in the dark, in the belly. And that's a sad thing. I hope we come across them or them, us. We can help them find their voice, find their presence. In Need this, their voice. In their 70s, 60s. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, that sage stage. Yeah, we've been threatening to have Jim Shanae come on and do a whole thing about um, sages. Sages, because yeah. he's in that stage of his life and the importance. I mean, they're so desperately needed. And I think about what you're sharing, Kevin and Jeff and SJ, the, and Greg, you're still here. I see you. The disciples themselves, they get quite a bit of ink, quite a bit of print through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. But then there's about a 20-year delay Hmm. when they start writing some stuff down. They're sages, and they write about how to and how not to, Hmm. who you are and who you aren't in the kingdom. Nothing wrong with being 30. We got to be 30. We got to be 40. But those years then leading up to the 50, 60, the king stage, which we've marked and are writing about. Yeah, those are hard. Those are hard stages. You know, as hard as I thought it was to be a dad of three girls under eight, three girls, 18, 16, 13, Mm. and where that decade went. Mm. And so these questions of identity, really these questions of orientation, if you understand what they are, that is a first huge step. The next step, is walking with God every step along the way after that because the coordinates change. Those Airbuses are parked at different places. Yeah. And they're meant to carry people from here to there, Mm -hmm. and they need a good pilot. So in terms of who am I now, Jesus, and who am I in Kevin's life, and who am I in Greg's life? I have different roles on these councils and in these friendships. And it's always important to know, okay, am I a quarterback on this team or am I a quarterback on every team? Uh, maybe, maybe not. What's needed here, God? Am I setting this one out? Who am I in in this moment? Where am I in this moment? And what's the good that you're up to in this moment, in this person's life? Because I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to get in the way, but I do want to partner with you in their glory and in their becoming. What's my part to play? What's my line to deliver? You know, do I have a cameo? Because you were talking about 1917, right? It's the significance of the cameos of some of those characters, some of those actors, right? They weren't in the story that long, but here comes the, was it a general or a colonel who, after his friend had- I think maybe it was a colonel. Colonel, yeah. and he's in the movie for five minutes. You know, I know the actor. He's in lots of other movies as a leading character mm-hmm. or a villain, right? Yeah. And then Cumberbatch at the end. Yep. The whole movie is about taking the message to that, to that guy, to that guy yeah. and he's in the movie for five minutes. And he has a very important moment. As we live in the larger story together, I think there are the fellowship of the ring that we are moving together across Middle Earth and Mordor together. You know, the five of us, the the eight of us, the 10 of us. But then there's those people that come and go. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were with us for the first mission, second, third, and fifth. But does that make sense? And so yes. this is so much bigger than, hey, here's the one, two, three, story, desire, journey. Nope. You know, and it just invites us to have a big life and yep. to pursue the big life, the larger life that God has for us. And the diagnosis that we all have and all suffer from is this cancer of sin and false self and the enemy's work to make sure that we get lost. But actually, the author of the story we'll have the last paragraph of the last chapter. And that's not even the last book. As we move and move and move again, like you said earlier, the Kierkegaard quote, you know, life has to be lived going forward and is understood looking Mm -hmm. backward. And so what you are bringing, Kevin, and what you can speak and say 
with the journey that you're on and what you can give color to. And I love the sages who say it this way. Well, I don't know about you, but for me, this is how it went. Or the other one I love so much is, have you talked to God about that? They want to be really careful to, you know, move in and move into advice and direction because they've met with God. That's what I mean. They've spent the kind of time with God that they know how sacred story, desire, and journey is. And they want to be very careful before they lend their experience, their advice, or their direction to a man on a journey. If we look about what could be the worst thing that could ever happen in life in the world would be the killing of God. And yet that turned into the salvation of the world. So now forevermore... Right, this can't be the that, story, that, right? You know, yeah. his disciples are saying, this can't be the story. And so forevermore, he changes mm -hmm. things. The very worst things in life have the possibility of becoming the very best things in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for you to talk about, Kevin, your experience of losing your marriage, your ministry, and your health, and to turn around now and say, all is well, is really unbelievable to have experienced that. And I think that's the thing about an elder. He's lived long enough to see the whole story unfold. Mm -hmm. So when I dropped my daughter off at the family school, a therapeutic boarding school, that wasn't the end of the story. Right. Fast forward a few years ago, I'm the captain and she's the flight attendant and we're going to Barbados together. <laughs> and the co-pilot has to use the restroom so the flight attendant has to come up and change places with them and there we are. We're sitting in a jet over the Caribbean. You know, I mean, so it's the full story, yeah, right? Awesome. It's, yeah. it's not yeah. just the tragedy. And that's what I think an elder can do is he could steady a person and say, hey, it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. Actually, this is a very necessary part of your journey. Yeah. Dis dismantling. The trust to, you know, we talk about point A, point B, or do this, this, and this. And we talk about the triangulation. For me, it became surrender. Yeah. Belief. And truly trusting in God, because we can sit here and you take everything away. And I've got some great friends and I have a wonderful relationship. But at the end of the day, God is all I've got. I mean, when it comes to physical, every time I sign a consent form, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. being satisfied in my mind and saying out loud that this does not diminish what I believe happened 2,000 years ago on my behalf. Right. You know, but also knowing that God brings us good doctors. He brings us wonderful people into our lives to learn to love us mm -hmm. in spite of our stuff. But the surrender, the belief right now, I can say I trust God more than I've ever trusted him in my life because that's all I got. Yeah. And that's well earned. Spoken like an oriented yeah, man. Yeah, spoken like an oriented man and an elder that walks with a limp mm -hmm. that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. Mm hmm it really occurs to me, listeners, that there may be some of you out there who are listening to this and are in this place of death that we're talking about. I mean, you are in a place of despair, and we just want to encourage you, as you walk through the dark time that you're going through, Sunday's coming. Amen. Sunday's coming for you. And so I want to encourage you to continue to walk. And as I said at one point, I don't remember if it was this podcast or last week, but put your hand on another man's shoulder and send up a flare and ask for, hey, I need to talk to somebody. Can I go get a cup of coffee? And if that guy wasn't a great listener, don't give up. Find mm -hmm. another guy and try again and keep trying until you find the man that God has for you to share with. And women too need that as well. If you need some help finding that man, Greg, why don't you tell him about allies real quick and how you can connect him with maybe a man within a zip code or two of where they are. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. As you were saying that, the scripture in Psalms about joy coming in the morning came up in my heart. Kevin and Haynes in the barn is a great example of a foxhole or a safe house here in the Charlotte, North Carolina area that you can go and you can find that sage, that elder. But men like you, your age, in your king stage or your warrior stage, that you can talk to and become that man God's designed you to be through the friendships that are so valuable. On our website, zoe.org forward slash allies, we have a frontline network where you can go and you can find a man in your area. You can find a foxhole, a safe house, where you can go 
and find other men like you in your stage of life and what you're going through, whatever it is, likely going through the heart of a warrior, wherever you are in the world, they're everywhere now. And we're so honored that God has brought such favor to that network and the barn being one of the chief of those types of ministries out there in the world. And so we'd invite you to go there, zoe.org forward slash allies, and let us help you find that strategic friendship, that redemptive mm-hmm. community where you too can go and find orientation. Yeah. There's, uh, I think, a Stephen Price, one of the men that we appreciate who is a counselor. There's some life coaches on there as well. If you're looking for that kind of assistance and, and maybe you want it to be a little bit more confidential listeners, you know, just shoot us an email, exploringmore at zoe.org. That comes to my inbox and doesn't go anywhere else. So if you want to connect with us, connect with Greg, connect with other allies in your area, I guess what we're saying is Come we've on. got multiple different ways That's to connect right. you. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. do not believe the lie You're that not you alone. are alone right. and yeah. that you are isolated in this because it's just not true. So reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Kevin, what is the web address for the barn? www.barnbrothers.org. And if you look on Google, Barn Brothers in Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina, Google yeah, knows better do than we do quite often. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but barnbrothers.org. Yeah, um, those guys meet out. every Tuesday night. Saturday almost. mornings as well. Uh, there's a group of guys that meet on Saturday mornings too. Yeah, so long and short, we want to say to you, Kevin, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time out of your here. schedule. Honored. Honored, honored, honored us honored. greatly, brother. It's Absolutely. Been awesome. Love you guys. As you shared you. Uh, in the first half of the podcast, we agreed we were here on holy ground in the midst of your vulnerability. So we are very thankful to be in the presence of an oriented man like you. So mm-hmm. thanks for coming in. Still on the journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, as we are. So we'll continue our exploration of orientation and look at next week where we are and then step into the good that God's up to in our lives as we look at halfway through this second pillar of Zoe. And thank you. If you have any comments, you know where to go. Write reviews in any of the platforms that you see on, the, on our website or what you're listening to on this podcast. Those reviews actually turn into billboards. They turn into encouragements. They turn into road signs actually for other people so you could have an impact even by leaving a review about exploring more podcasts until next time blessings on the journey we hope you have enjoyed this episode of exploring more the landing page for this podcast is zoe.org forward slash podcast that's z-o-w-e-h dot org forward slash podcast where you can find the show notes and various platforms to which we broadcast. You can also find us and the life of more by visiting Zoe on Uversion Bible app, Right Now Media, our Facebook page, and Zoe on Instagram and Twitter. Remember, with God there is always more, and you were made for more. Mm-hmm.